Hello, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is the final workshop of Systematic Literature Review. In this section, I'm going to introduce what is quality assessment in Systematic Literature Review, how to do it, and what kind of tools are available. Let's begin. English idiom says, don't judge a book by its cover. It's the same in research. We should not take published studies at, its, at their face value. So which side are you on? If an article is published in your nature, do you assume that it must be good quality? Or do you have your personal judgment and doubts? Why you need a quality assessment in your systematic literature review? Well, it can help you develop a greater understanding of your studies and other people's results. It distinguishes between good quality and poor quality studies. It is more likely this way you can draw meaningful conclusions from the data. It also offers you opportunity to acquire critical appraisal skill and often validated systematic literature review checklist includes it to evaluate one systematic literature reviews that is quality. When we say quality, we mean, we mean two layers. One is quality of individual studies. So all those individual studies you include for the review. When we check the quality of such studies, we mean the degree to which a study employs measures to minimize error and bias in its design, conduct, and analysis. The second layer of quality in a systematic literature review directly refers to the quality of the review itself. So often you need to use a validated systematic literature review checklist tool to check the quality. When a person says, oh, this is a good quality study, he or she means, I'm confident that this study's design, conduct, and analysis are robust provide the results that are credible, trustworthy, and generalizable, and are highly likely to be a true representation of the results of the tested intervention, phenomenon, or exposure. When to do a qualitative a qual quality assessment is highly depending on you. Um, if you intend to exclude poor quality studies in your review, you should do it before the data extraction. Um, if you do it after data extraction, you will be blind towards the quality of individual studies when extracting data, and your report is likely to be biased. Um, but in this way, if you do it after data extraction, your greater familiarity towards poor studies can help you answer QA questions better. QA tools often ask questions about bias, and bias types are many. Assessment of risk of bias covers at least six bias that are covered in red in the table that you see on the screen. So um, you can pause this video to look at the details about these uh, um, different types of bias. Um, but as you can see that I highlighted um, six ones in red, I'm going to in detail explain them one by one. The first one is a selection bias. So you see there are a lot of cute ducks here, right? So we see the population on the right are gray ducks, a group of very gray healthy ducks here. But if your sample is like this, is it representative of the population? So selection bias deals with the question, is the, same, is the sample representative of the population? Sample here, population here. You have to make sure the sample represents the population well. The second type of bias is allocation bias. So you get the sample here. You are going to allocate it into treatment group and control group. But if you, on purpose, assign a healthy fatty one duck into the treatment group, which receives 
the a company's uh, uh, duck food and the sick disabled ducks into control group that are fed with usual farm food, then you are basically manipulating your experiment. Uh, and it has this very high level of allocation bias. So allocation bias deals with how participants get assigned to treatment. They're random, randomized or they're not. It's a human playing uh, intervention, intervention role here to influence the allocation result. The third type is performance bias. Let's say using the same example, we assign a, a group of a sample, our sample of ducks into treatment group and the control groups. And the, the, the duck in the treatment group is, is aware that he um, it is eating healthy food and uh, it feels very healthy and it tries to run more to get fit, let's say. And this is what we call observer effect. So the participants actually change their behavior or modify their behavior due to the existence of observer. Okay, so that's one, one type of performance bias that can happen to the participant. And for the um, intervention providers in this case, are the farmers who is feeding the ducks. So he might think, I need to give a special care to this fatty duck here because the investigators said to me it is the most important duck. Okay, so because of his awareness of the assignment um, of the fat duck to treatment group, um, he is adjusting his performance as uh, intervention providers. The third type is related to study investigators. They are aware of the um, treatment group and the control group, and uh, they see that in the, in the treatment group they have this uh, fatty duck um, that can influence the results very, very much. So they com communicate to the intervention providers um, because they think this fatty duck uh, from treatment group needs better care. So, so study investigators, intervention providers, uh, participants can adjust their performance uh, in, the, in this kind of research design. This is performance bias. So it deals with the question, is anyone, including these three groups, is anyone in this group aware of the treatment or made blinded? The next bias is detection bias. The previous ones were about participants, intervention um, providers, and the study investigators. In this detection bias, it's about people who measure the outcome. So the lab people who receive the results, but he also knows that, oh, this fatty duck is in this treatment group. When he looks at this fatty duck's performance, he says, oh, the, his, this duck's performance is indeed better than other ducks. It's kind of affirmative bias. He already knows this one received this kind of care, and uh, it is, he has this assumption that he, this duck's going to perform better and he only look at the data that proves his assumption. So this can be um, called detection bias. It deals with the question, is anyone aware of the treatment or made blinded, especially involving people who measure the outcome? The next type is attrition bias. That is about proportion of participants who stopped the treatment either by self drop out or withdraw by the studies. So let's say um, again in the same example, um, during the intervention, during the treatment, um, the fatty duck is in the treatment group, the weaker ducks, um, they are in control group. And uh, but in the end, um, in the control group, only one small duck survived. All other two disabled ducks, they, they died um, due to certain reasons. 
so this is uh, about retention rates of participants throughout the treatment. So this is attrition bias. Another type of bias is reporting bias. So are all outcomes stated to be measured actually reported despite its being favorable or not to the authors? Are some results measured post hoc for the sake of enhancing favorable outcomes? Another type of bias is confounders. So participants' characteristics are similar across all treatments uh, regarding, for instance, gender, age, health status, social status. So use the ducks example. So uh, let's say in the treatment group, they assign this um, healthy gray ducks. In the control group, they assign similar characteristics uh, um, Assign similar ducks with uh, similar um, characteristics, or in another um, setting, they actually use the healthy ducks in the treatment group, but selected um, another type of yellow duck ducks for the control group. That will uh, cause the the uh, different species of ducks playing a co co co-founder here uh, to impact both the, the independent variable and the dependent variable. So for doing quality assessment in systematic literature review, you probably will go through six steps like what you can see on the screen. The first step will be note the designs of your included studies, followed by identify the types of QA tools to suit your review, choose the appropriate QA tools, carry out QA using the appropriate tools, tabulate and summarize the results of your QA, Finally, think about how your QA results might impact on the conclusions and recommendations of your review. Let's remember that it is the study design that guides your choice of QA tool, not to the review topic area. Different study designs um, have different levels of evidence. Um, so as you can see here from this table, Table. The strength of the experimental design is therefore uh, largely re reliant um, on four factors, including randomization, control group, sample size, and generalizability. Um, for quantitative studies, um, the, the ran randomized control trials ha has the highest strength as evidence, while uh, well, study designs such as case report, expert opinion, personal observations have a low level of strength as evidence. And as for randomization, randomized control trial is usually have their participants random, randomly assigned, while other types of study designs, they don't. And for the um, having control group or not, you have the RCT with the control group, um, prospective cohort study with the control group, case control study with the control group, and other studies they don't. Uh, also, uh, re retrospective cohort study um, also has also has um, control group and other study types don't. So um, you have to look through this table to understand better about different study designs. So what are they exactly? To look at the terms, um, probably it's a bit vague, but let's try to use some figures to understand. So for randomized controlled trial is you have a sample, you assign them um, randomly, into two groups or several groups, and then you give intervention to one group, and uh, you 
keep the other group as control group without uh, much change. And then you observe the results of these uh, groups. So uh, it's called a randomized control trial because one, the participants are randomly assigned to there is uh, at least one control group as reference to compare results. Different from um, randomized control group, you have non-randomized studies, uh, in short, NRS. So here the difference is the randomization about the participant allocation um, is removed here. So you have this a defined population, and then they are non-randomized, allocated to different groups, and uh, they compare results in the end. For cohort study, uh, you can have prospective comparative study or retrospective cohort study. There's two types. So for the cohort study, you often um, Either you have the study, uh, so this is study time uh, when the study was was done, okay? And then you, if you look back into the past to do this uh, study, it's called a retrospective cohort study. If you, the intervention didn't happen yet, the result is expected to happen in the future, then it is it is a prospective cohort study. For case control, it's related to um, control the characteristics of uh, participants. So a group of participants with a particular conditions are matched for age and other characteristics with a control group of participants who do not have the conditions. For case series, you have a person or a series of persons who has been given a similar treatment is followed for a specific time period. So as you can see here uh, in this graph, you have the baseline period here, here and here. You have the pre-exposure period of seven days as indicated here. And then you have exposed period divided into three risk windows here and here. For cross-sectional design, you are probably very familiar with it because it is widely used. And for instance, you use a survey uh, to collect data from a number of people of other sources at one point in time. So as I said before, different study designs has different levels of strength as evidence. So as you can see from this pyramid, the top, the top uh, tip of the pyramid is about, uh, um, for instance, a meta-analysis systematic review. That's the highest level of evidence. And you have a randomized control trial and uh, you have cohort studies. You have case case control studies, a case report or case series, and the least uh, um, the least strong uh, evidence is animal and laboratory studies, and these are all related to quantitative study uh, quantitative evidence. The second step is to identify the types of QA tools to suit your review. So there's a list of QA tools that you can look for and study more. And uh, you can also click on the link of, uh, um, of QA tools I provided here. Um, you can check the um, description of this video part for the slides. Um, so quite often, different QA tools have different items. You have to to judge how lengthy they are, how practical they are, how suitable they are to um, by considering your study, your reviews.
So this is a table that basically lists out um, for different types of QA tool, how many items um, are included, um, what year was it publi published, and the applicable study designs related to them. For different tools, they cover different types of bias. As we said before, QA tools uh, ask questions to check bias. So um, by looking at this table, you can see some um, comparison of different QA tools uh, with the black dots as, um, as indicating that type of bias being covered, the white dot being uncovered. So you can see here Acrobat, um, Berger is, is for and uh, um, Robans and uh, uh, this uh, race, race Tyson, they all have good coverage of um, different types of bias. The next two steps uh, are to uh, execute the um, the quality assessment by using the selected um, QA tool and tabulate and summarize results using the, the tools. This is only a screenshot of a QA tool uh, which contains different questions to ask you about bias. So you use for each study, you use this kind of uh, uh, questions to grade or to, to, ch to check against and you will, you will have results um, based on answering these questions. Then you tabulate and summarize these results into a table like this one. That will help you compare uh, the qualities uh, be between studies. That's all for today's presentation. It's been very late. And uh, um, I hope it can help you understand a little bit better about quality assessment in systematic literature review. Here are some more resources that you can refer to um, for a better understanding. Thank you for your attention. I will see you in the next video.